Hey guys, it's Randy Knights. I just finished watching the fifth Hunger Games movie. Uh, the Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. This is a prequel to the original 2012 uh, film. And obviously you can replace the word film with novel if you want, but I'm definitely more of a movie watcher than a reader. But I did read the original Hunger Games novel as well. But yeah, for me I'm more of a film fan. So, this is a prequel and we're... It's basically an origin story for President Snow, and it also follows a District 12 girl who is trying to win the Hunger Games, but the catch here is that it's the 10th annual Hunger Games, and um, they don't have, they, like, the game runner themselves don't actually know how to properly run it yet. So we're kind of watching their sec, like, we're secondhand experiencing their incompetence, and their inability to run a successful Hunger Game. So, yeah. So, uh, first of all, is this movie better than um, Mockingjay Part 1 and Part 2? Hell yeah, it is. Obviously it is. I mean, how could it not be? I absolutely loathed both of those movies. Part 2 is tolerable, but Part 1 is like one of the most painful things I've ever watched. So, absolutely hate Mockingjay Part 1, and Part 2 wasn't that much better either. And interestingly, and surprisingly to me, this is actually the same director as those movies. So, I, I imagine it's because he also did Catching Fire. Francis Lawrence did Catching Fire, which is an, obviously, I gave it a 10 out of 10, it's an amazing film. Um, so that's probably why he was allowed to do this one as well. Um, because if he didn't have Catching Fire on his record and it was just those two Mockingjay movies, I highly doubt he would have been called back for this one. But he doesn't really screw it up that badly here. Um, and I'm saying that because, yes, inherently there are some issues, there are some fundamental problems. The premise is honestly not that strong, and uh, it's debatable whether it needs to exist in the first place. But I'm definitely going to be a champion of this, and I'm going to defend it and recommend you go see it, because I had a really good time with it. So while I do admit that it's fundamentally flawed, I, uh, I do think it's more than worth your time. And uh, it's actually very good money-wise, This um, because this prequel film could have been just a blatant cash grab, call it a day, right? But it's a little bit more than that. It's a two and a half hour movie that feels like a trilogy's worth of content in one single runtime, and they're really going the extra mile to make sure everything is explained and everything is elaborated on. So you do get your money's worth with this as far as runtime goes. But yeah, so the story here is uh, we're following Cornelius Snow, who is now a young man. Uh, he lives in the capital but his family's not rich because the capital, uh, in general, the, the families and the houses of the capital are a lot more poor here than they are in the other films because this is just getting off the end of the war against the rebels. In fact, the rebels haven't even been completely snuffed out in this. They're a constant issue in this as well. So the capital's not that rich, but they are sophisticated, or so they say. And uh, he is selected as a mentor for a District 12 girl named, why am I blanking on her name? He says it like a million times, why am I blanking on it? Hold on, now I want to see. And I did like her, so I'm surprised I forgot her name, but uh, Lucy Gray. Okay, it's kind of a generic name, maybe that's why I forgot it. So Cornelius Snow is a mentor for Lucy Gray, and Lucy Gray is a very talented singer, that's like her whole thing, is that she's a great singer, and um, Lucy's obviously not impressed with, you know, being forced into the Hunger Games, you know, being reaped by the capital and being forced, uh, and he seems to have good intentions, this film definitely places an emphasis on humanizing and uh, kind of redeeming him and showing other sides to him, so for the most part, Snow is a good guy in this, and he is trying his best to successfully mentor and save the life of his tribute that he's been selected. And as we all know, um, I'm not going to like go into the universe too much right now because I assume you've seen the other movies. Even though this is a prequel, there's no way you haven't seen the original film, so I don't need to talk about the universe too much. But, you know, there's 24 tributes. They're between the ages of 12 and 18. They're forced to the death, to go into an arena and fight to the death. And uh, there will be one victor. However, like I said before, this is the 10th Hunger Game. They don't know how to run it properly, so 
this game maker is more than willing to just end them all and not even have a victor if she wants. Um, overall, I did like the game maker, but I just have some problems with, uh, like performance wise, but I just have some problems with the game itself. So, yeah. Should we start with, yeah, let's start with the positives. So, like I said before, this one, you're getting your money's worth. This is a, this is an epic. I would actually classify this as an epic. And by an epic, I mean it's, it's the full picture. There's no baiting. There's no, oh, you're going to have to see the next one to figure out what happens. This is a full, complete story that uh, is tackling some pretty interesting, well-written characters. And uh, overall, I felt the execution in terms of drama, romance, um, the universe, stakes, all of that w was very, very well done. So I actually think this romance between Lucy and Cornelius was actually more believable than uh, the love triangle with Katniss, to be honest. So it's nice to see them kind of learn from the past and sort of grow um, and do better love interests. So that was really good. I liked the cast a lot. I felt they were, I mean, yeah, it always does kind of bother me to, to cast adults in child roles, but I mean, this is the Hunger Games. They're going, they're fighting to the death, right? So I don't think you can really show too much with actual kids. So makes sense. But yeah, for the record, this uh, Cornelius, his actor is 29 years old in real life. So but that's kind of how these young adult uh, novel movies always go, right? They always, they always pick very old people to do uh, the young roles for some reason. So overall, I really liked it. It was very engaging, very well written. Uh, there was no moments that made me scratch my head and go, wow, that's really dumb. For the, it's two hours and a, it's two and a half hours of believable, high quality, uh, really fleshed out content. Uh, but I want to stress home the fact that the best stuff here is the drama, relationship, and learning about in the character study of Cornelius. So let's go into the negatives now. So negative number one. Now, yes, this is still a positive. This movie actually has a Hunger Game. That is obviously a positive. That was like, that was the number one issue of the previous two films, was their Hunger Games movies without a Hunger Game. And the whole point I'm watching this is for a Hunger Game. That's why I'm into it. Um, that's why everyone wants to watch it, right? So, this one already starts off on a good foot with that. This one actually has a Hunger Game. But, just to play devil's advocate a little bit here, let's, let's try and tear the Hunger Game apart. And, and let's talk about why it's the worst one of the three that we've seen now. So, this Hunger Game is unfortunately being, yes, it's all universe correct and lore correct, but just from a viewing experience, here's, okay, so problem number one. This film should have been a little bit more into the future, just a little bit, maybe five to ten years extra into the future, because this film is really covering the beginning of how the Hunger Games came to be. It's dealing with the issue of whether the people of, uh, the capital actually want a Hunger Game, or if they think it's morally wrong. So there's this chance of the game not even happening in the future at all. Um, people, the, Pen the people of Pen Am are not even invested in the Hunger Game because, you know, they treat the tributes like zoo animals. They literally place them in a zoo. So these are just random zoo animals that nobody gives a crap about. So these tributes are the most uninteresting tributes we've ever had in the series. Uh, they're, they're nothing like Finnick or... Katniss, obviously, or anyone like that. These are the most uninteresting tributes by far. Um, and uh, part of the problem is that, again, all this stuff is technically logical and makes sense, but I think the film, if, if the film wanted to be a better viewing experience for longtime fans, I think it should have been set five to ten years in the future because we could still cover the early days. I mean, this doesn't even make him an old guy because he could literally just be a 29-year-old playing a 29-year-old instead of a 29 playing a... 18 or whatever he's supposed to be, right? So you don't even have to change the cast. Just move the universe five to ten years in the future, and then we don't have to deal with all the behind-the-scenes BS of whether the Hunger Game is morally correct. Like, obviously it's not. We've already covered that up to this point, so that's not an interesting point. We already know the Hunger Games are wrong. But that's why we're watching the film, is to watch people battle to the death, etc. So we don't need to cover stuff like whether the Hunger Game is morally correct. We don't need to cover the forming of the rules and what is and is not acceptable. We don't need to cover um, how to monetize the Hunger Game, how to get donations from people. I mean, the film itself, the people of Pan Am are not invested in the Hunger Game and they don't care. In fact, they, they 
care so little that there's a huge chance that the Hunger Games will just be stopped and this will be the last one because nobody cares. They're not getting good ratings, they're not getting enough money. It's just not worth the time and effort of running these games in the first place. So that's what this film has to deal with is all the stuff surrounding that of um, the incompetence and the confusion of the the devils behind this game. They don't know how to run it properly. So it's not nearly as awesome um, and interesting as Catching Fire, for example, where the tributes are treated like royalty. They get like these sci-fi apartments. They're given special training simulations with high advanced technology. Um, the, I mean, the even the 2012 movie, in that one, they literally have this giant arena and just at the snap of your finger, you can summon in a bunch of CGI shadow beasts that can like just actually harm people. So this one is set in prehistoric times, it feels like. They're using like 1950s televisions uh, to, to broadcast and they don't have any special effects or anything. They literally just pull out a rinky-dink arena that gets bombed by the terrorists and then they can't even bother to switch location. So they literally use the terrorist bombing location as the arena and then they don't even bother to cover the exits. So the tributes are able to run down into the tunnels beneath the arena and camp out there. So we have a bunch of Call of Duty campers in this one and the game gets extended way longer than it's supposed to because the game makers are just incompetent and they don't know any better. Um, so that entire rant right there is just to sum it up. Yes, I'm happy there's a Hunger Game here, but my, my point of that rant was it's the worst Hunger Game of them all because it's intentionally low budget, it's intentionally done poorly, and it's supposed to be it's supposed to be as bad and low effort as possible because the capital doesn't have any confidence in the Hunger Games yet and it's not an established tradition. So while yes, it, I, I'm not going to take too many points away because it's entirely logical and it makes total sense, but it's a little bit frustrating just because, uh, you know, hung, the original Hunger Games movie was how many years ago? Like 11 years ago and it has a far superior game than this one. So there you go. That's my entire rant, but that's just literally just for one point. I just want to say the Hunger Game is flawed. Not, It's not terrible. At least we have one. It's much better than not having one at all, but it's definitely fundamentally flawed. The other point I want to... So that was entirely for one point. I just really want to justify that. My second and last point for negatives is going to be, yes, the film is extremely long and I was very engaged and for the most part I didn't really want it to end. I was really into it. I would argue that uh, the resources and runtime are maybe misplaced. So this film does what a lot of modern movies are doing with the parts. I hate that stuff. Obviously every single movie ever has part systems, like that's why they're called Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. But I don't like the modern movies that literally place Act 1 on the screen. So this film has three acts and they literally go to like screens dedicated to telling you which act we're on. And unfortunately, once Act 2 ends, Act 3, which is a significant portion of the movie, is dedicated entirely to Snow's turn to evil. And I felt like we could have done this faster, or we could have de dedicated more time to the Hunger Game itself, made it a bit better in general, and then maybe a little less time to Snow. Because I already know Snow is an evil guy. You know, you don't really have to convince me that much. I already, like, we've already seen Snow's fate. We know exactly what happens to him. Um, so you don't need to dedicate that much time. Yes, it's very high quality and it's a lot better than I expected, but I get it. You know, he's a bad guy. I, I understand. But to their credit, it is believable. I felt like his, uh, his turn to evil was very natural, actually. Um, considering the movie has that issue of it, ha he has to be evil by the end of it. They do it very well here. Uh, it's very slow paced and, um, natural. Um... So I was never rolling my eyes in this entire film, and I think that's the, the best thing about it, because I rolled my eyes in every single other film, a Hunger Games film, uh, including the original two masterpieces. But this one, I did not roll my eyes a single time. I was very much into it. So I'm going to give The Ballad of Songs and Snakes an 8 out of 10, which is a lot higher than most people, but it's because I was having such a great time with it. I was very engaged, and uh, I also loved... like. This film defied my expectations because it didn't focus on fan service. It didn't focus on being cash grabby and as quick as possible. Like this very easily could have been a one and a half hour prequel that nostalgia baits and all that. But instead it's its own thing. It's very fleshed out and very and executed very well at a high level. Um, 
they could have tried to save budget, but they don't. They go all out with the sets and everything here. So I highly recommend Hunger Games 5, uh, and I'm definitely, I would watch uh, number 6. I don't know what they would do for that, but just take my advice. Just go 10 to 15 years in the future and make another movie about that. And we can have some better sci-fi elements, uh, some better action, and uh, we don't have to worry about you know, the moral culpability of the situation because obviously we all know the Hunger Games are bad, we all know the President Snow is bad, so not, not exactly the most warranted premise ever, but after watching it, so basically on paper this film shouldn't, this on paper this film doesn't work at all. In fact, I bet if I read the no novel I probably wouldn't have liked it, but as a film and as a fan of these, the last four, this one really stood out and I do recommend it. And it also redeemed Francis Lawrence in my eyes because he did a terrible job with the last two movies. Even if the source material was bad, I'm sure he's still to blame for those last two atrocities. But this one, very good. 8 out of 10, I do recommend.